chapter two, ecosystems and biomes. Through this chapter, we're going to be figuring out how does energy and matter move through ecosystems and where do living things even get their food? Lesson one, energy flows in ecosystems. After this lesson, we will be able to name and describe energy roles that organisms play in an ecosystem, as well as explain how energy moves through an ecosystem. My Planet Diary. I'll have a fish. Scientists have noticed something fishy going on with the wolves in British Columbia, Canada. During autumn, the wolves ignore their typical food of deer and moose and feast on salmon instead. Salmon are very nutritious and lack the big horns and hooves that can injure or kill wolves. Plus, there are plenty of fish in a small area, making them easier to find and catch. Many animals, including the wolves, depend on the salmon's annual mating trip upstream. Losing this important food source to overfishing would hurt the populations of bears, wolves, birds, and many other animals. Question one says, what are two reasons the wolves may eat fish in the autumn instead of deer or moose? Well, as an example, maybe the fish are easier to find than deer or moose, or maybe the fish aren't gonna hurt the wolves. You know, deer and moose have giant little antler horns who stab a stab them. That wouldn't be fun. Question two says, what effect could overfishing salmon have on an ecosystem? So overfishing means that humans are coming and they're getting a lot of fish at one time that they don't really need to get at one time. So that means that the salmon population is going to decrease. And at the same time, well then the number of predators that are eating the salmon will decrease. Either they'll be starved out or they'll go elsewhere in search of food. And then because those predators are leaving, they're not eating the fish that's left over, so therefore the fish population can increase. It's an endless cycle. What are the energy roles in an ecosystem? Do you play an instrument in your school band? If so, you know that each instrument has a role in a piece of music. Similar to instruments in a band, each organism has a role in the movement of energy through its ecosystem. An organism's energy role is determined by how it obtains food and how it interacts with other organisms. Each of the organisms in an ecosystem fills the energy role of producer, consumer, or decomposer. So our producers. Energy enters most ecosystems as sunlight. Some organisms, like the plants and algae shown in figure one, and some types of bacteria, capture the energy of sunlight and store it as food energy. These organisms use the sun's energy to turn water and carbon dioxide into food molecules in a process called photosynthesis. An organism that can make its own food is a producer. In the sense of, I'm not a producer because I can go to the stove and make food myself. That's not what they're talking about. They're meaning like inside your body food is made. Kind of. Producers are the source of all the food in an ecosystem. In a few ecosystems, producers obtain energy from a source other than sunlight. One such ecosystem is found in rocks deep beneath the ground. Certain bacteria in this ecosystem produce their own food using the energy in hydrogen sulfide, a gas that is present in their environment. So down here at the bottom, we have figure one, showing you some producers. It shows tape grass and water milfoil, fun. It says producers are organisms that can make their own food. Complete the shopping list below to identify the producers that are part of your diet. 
They've given us wheat, corn, and bananas. So thinking along those same lines, perhaps lettuce, oranges, apples, rice, those count. Next up, we have consumers. Some members of an ecosystem, like the organisms listed in figure two, cannot make their own food. An organism that obtains energy by feeding on other organisms is a consumer. Consumers are classified by what they eat. Consumers that eat only plants are herbivores. Some familiar herbivores are caterpillars, rabbits, and deer. Consumers that eat only animals are carnivores. Wolves, walruses, and snakes are some examples of carnivores. Consumers that eat both plants and animals are omnivores. Crows, bears, and humans are omnivores. Some carnivores are scavengers. A scavenger is a carnivore that feeds on the bodies of dead organisms. Scavengers include catfish and vultures. And our third type is decomposers. If an, organ if an ecosystem had only producers and consumers, the raw materials of life, such as carbon and nitrogen, would stay locked up in wastes and the bodies of dead organisms. However, there are organisms in ecosystems that prevent this from happening. Decomposers break down biotic wastes and dead organisms and return the raw materials to the ecosystem. You can think of decomposers as nature's recyclers. While obtaining energy for their own needs, decomposers return simple molecules to the environment. These molecules can be used again by other organisms. Mushrooms, bacteria, and mold are common decomposers. What happened here? While you were hiking, some hungry animals turned your campsite upside down. In the table on the next page, check off the clues that relate to the organisms that were in the area. Using the clues, see if you can determine the order in which the organisms visited the campsite. So we have bear, mold, rabbit, wolf, and on the side we have our clues. I'm going to say pause this video real quick and take a peek at what's going on so I don't have to explain everything that's going on. So our first clue says, can easily reach the tabletop. Well, we can see our tabletop right here. Whoa, I'm moving my page. We can, we can see that, okay, we're just gonna have to be wonky, I guess. Try it again. We can see our table right here. We're trying to find what can easily reach the tabletop. Probably not the mold. And we can see that there's still vegetables on the table, so probably not the rabbit. But who's tall enough to reach the table? A bear and a wolf. Grows on food and breaks it down. Hmm, well, the only thing that we know that can break stuff down are decomposers, and we know bear, rabbit, and wolf are not decomposers, so mold. Small enough to enter and exit the tent. Mold doesn't really move, and it doesn't look like there's anything in there. A bear probably could not fit in this tent, not its whole body. But a rabbit could, and the wolf could. Gets energy from meat. Well, bears can. Mold can. Wolves can. Not rabbits, though. Strong enough to open a cooler. Bear probably could. Not a picky eater bear. They're omnivores. Gets energy from plants. Well, bear's omnivore. Mold can just be mold, and rabbits are herbivores. Now we got that settled, we have to figure out what order did these organisms visit our campsite? Well, I would say it's probably the wolf, then the rabbit came, then the bear came, and then the mold. Well, the mold probably was there first, honestly. 
So maybe mold, then wolf, then rabbit, then bear. I don't know, what do you think? Assess your understanding. 1A. Describe. An organism's energy role is determined by how it obtains what and how it what with other organisms. Did you say an organism's energy role is determined by how it obtains food and how it interacts with other organisms? Because if so, you're right. Letter B says, what is the main source of energy for all three energy roles and why? Sunlight, my dudes. The sun. Why? Well, producers use it to make food. Consumers eat the producers. And then the decomposers break down the producers. So, really, energy is needed for everybody. Or well, the sunlight is needed for everybody. How does energy move through an ecosystem? As you have read, energy enters most ecosystems as sunlight and is converted into food by producers. This energy is transferred to the organisms that eat the producers and then to other organisms that feed on the consumers. Energy moves through an ecosystem when one organism eats another. This movement of energy can be shown as food chains, food webs, and energy pyramids. Food chains. One way to show how energy moves in an ecosystem is with a food chain. A food chain is a series of events in which one organism eats another and obtains energy. You can follow one example of a food chain in figure three. Well, let's take a peek at figure three, actually. It's this picture right here on the side, plants to grasshopper to red fox. It says, in this food chain, you can see how energy moves from plants to a grasshopper to the fox. The arrows show how energy moves up the food chain from one organism to the next. So it's saying the grasshopper is eating the plants and the red fox is eating the grasshopper. Who's eating the plants? Food webs. A food chain shows only one possible path along which energy can move through an ecosystem. Fox to grasshopper to plant. Most producers and consumers are part of many food chains. A more realistic way to show the flow of energy through an ecosystem is with a food web. As shown in figure 4, a food web consists of many overlapping food chains in an ecosystem. Organisms may play more than one role in an ecosystem. Look at the crayfish in figure 4. A crayfish is an omnivore that is a first level consumer when it eats plants. But when a crayfish eats a snail, it is a second level consumer. Just as food chains overlap and connect, food webs interconnect as well. A gull might eat a fish at the ocean, but it also might eat a mouse at a landfill. The gull then is part of two food webs, an ocean food web and a land food web. All the world's food webs interconnect in what can be thought of as a global food web. If you recall, the food web, the food chain I mean, was just one straight shot of a line. Here we've got a food web, logically called because it kind of looks like a spider web. We can see they're color coded, each level is color coded. And let's just read the list down the side. Third level consumers, in the red, eat the second level consumers. So it's saying the fox is eating whatever is in yellow. The second level consumers eat the first level consumers. So anything in yellow is eating the blue. First level consumers are organisms that feed directly on the producers. So the blue is eating the green. Producers form the base of the food web. The first organism in a food chain is always a producer. But then we have decomposers. And the decomposers consume the wastes and remains of other organisms. So if we were, we could draw a line from snail 
a little arrow towards the mushroom so the point of the arrow is facing the mushroom. And maybe the crayfish would do the same thing because it's decomposer. Maybe if the crayfish died or the snail pooped, the mushroom would eat those. So we can also see <clears throat> it's not only the first level that the fox is eating at the top. We can see an arrow from the yellow heron to the red fox so we know the fox can eat the heron. But there's also a line from plants to fox. So the fox can eat that also. It's just showcasing that there are different types of ways in a food web that animals and plants can eat other organisms. So the fox, even though it says it's a third level consumer, can also be a second level consumer. So if the fox is eating a first level consumer, so if the fox is eating a grasshopper, well then it would be a second level consumer. But if the fox is eating a shrew, then the fox would be the third level consumer. Food webs are more complicated than a food chain, but they are better to showcase the flow. And then we get energy pyramids. When an organism in an ecosystem eats, it obtains energy. Logic. The organism uses some of this energy to move, grow, reproduce, and carry out other life activities. These activities produce heat, a form of energy, which is then released into the environment. When heat is released, the amount of energy that is available to the next consumer is reduced. A diagram called an energy pyramid shows the amount of energy that moves from one feeding level to another in a food web. You can see an energy pyramid in figure 5. The most energy is available at the producer level of the pyramid. As energy moves up the pyramid, each level has less energy available than the level below. An energy pyramid gets its name from the shape of the diagram, wider at the base, narrower at the top. In general, only about 10% of the energy at one level of the food web is transferred to the next higher level. Most of the energy at each level is converted to heat. Since about 90% of the food energy is converted to heat at each step, there is not enough energy to support many feeding levels in an ecosystem. The organisms at higher feeding levels of an energy pyramid do not necessarily require less energy to live than the organisms at a lower level. Because so much energy is converted to heat at each level, the amount of energy available at the producer level limits the number of consumers that the ecosystem is able to support. As a result, there are usually fewer organisms at the highest level in a food web. So here we have the energy pyramid and energy pyramid. This energy pyramid shows the energy available at each level of a food web and how it is calculated. Energy is measured in kilocalories or kcal. So we can see at the bottom our producers, they tell us this is a thousand kilocalories. To bump it to the next level, to the first level consumers, we have to multiply it by 10%. 10% as a decimal is 0 0.1. So we take the 1,000 kilocalories and we times it by 0.1 and we get 100 kilocalories. So our first level consumers are at 100 kilocalories. That's a major difference. If we're going from 100 and we want to go first to second level, we times 100 by 10% or by 0.1, that's 10 kilocalories. So our second level consumers are 10 kilocalories. That's how much energy is available at the second level consumer. If we need to go again to our third and final level consumers, 
Well, we have our 10 kilocalories times it by 0.1 for 10%, and we get one kilocalorie. So if we look, our producers, the energy there was 1,000. But we get up to the owl and our energy now is one. Huge difference between the levels. Do the math. Energy pyramids. Suppose that the producers at the base of an energy pyramid contain 330,000 kilocalories. So our bottom level is 330,000 kilocalories. Using figure five as a guide, so our picture from the last slide, label how much energy would be available at each level of the pyramid based on the questions below. Okay, cool. Number one, if mice ate all of the plants, how much energy would be available to them as first level consumers? So we're going from our producer level, our producer level up to our first level consumers. We know that we have to multiply each level by 10%. So by 10%. So what we're doing is 330,000 times 0 0.1, because 10% is 0 0.1. And we get 33,000 kilocalories. We need to have our units in there. Otherwise, I'm going to say 33,000 what? 33,000 elephants? 33,000 uh, trombones in the big parade? Like, what is it? Number two said if all the mice were then eaten, uh, RIP mice, if they were eaten by snakes, how much energy would the snakes receive? Again, we go up a level. We're multiplying by 0 0.01 for 10%. So 33,000 times 0 0.1 is now 3,300 kilocalories. But okay, now let's say all the snakes were eaten by that owl. The owl was our third level consumer. How much energy would the owl receive? Again, we're multiplying by 0 0.1. So 3,300 times, or times 0 0.1, 330 kilocalories. 330, sorry. Let's try that again. There you go. Number four is a challenge question. It says, about how much energy would the owl use for its life process, processes, or lose as heat? Hmm. Well, we know that 10% of 330, so now we have 330 times 10%. We know that's going to be 33. So we take our 330 and we minus 33 and we get 297. So how much energy would the owl use? 297 kilocalories. And then how much energy would be stored in the owl's body? 33. Boom. That's it. That's all we got. Food webs, food chains, consumers, ecosystems, science. Next up, this video is done. Make sure you go work on your worksheet. And I will see you on, what is today? Today is, today is Tuesday. I will, this is for Wednesday. See you on Friday. Whew. Days of the week, my dudes. Goodbye.